everyone, my name is Rachel and we're continuing with our five part lesson series about where our food comes from, what our food does for our bodies, and how our food grows in the world around us. So like I mentioned with our six plant part lessons, today we're mostly focusing on pollinators. So you might have noticed the title of our lesson is The Buzz on Bees, and that's mostly because bees are our number one pollinator. And a lot of times when I start this lesson, my students will say, oh my gosh, bees, the honeybee. And that's absolutely awesome that we have so much knowledge about honeybees, especially starting at a young age. But today we also wanted to take some time to focus a little bit on our wild bees in addition, because I know I didn't really learn about wild bees until later in life, and I wasn't really 100% sure what they even were. So we're going to talk about honeybees and wild bees today. But really quickly to do a recap from last week's lesson, um, we were talking about the six parts of the plant, right? Our root at the bottom, our stem, which goes through the plant and our branches, which are also the part of the stem, our leaves, the tomatoes, which are basically the fruit of the plant coming from the flower, which needs to be pollinated, thus our lesson for today. And of course, the seeds that are located inside of the fruit. So really quickly, just think to yourself, you know, we are aware that animals, insects, invertebrates, bacteria, fungi, all these things are very important for helping our foods to grow. But do you have any guesses as to what some of these might be? Obviously, one of these is bees, right? This is the name of our lesson, so bees are very important. But take a second to think to yourself, or maybe even write down on a piece of paper, what other insects, animals, bugs, fungi are going to help us make our food. Specifically, there's one very important job that transitions our flower to a fruit. Do you have any idea what maybe the name for that job is? If you guess pollination, you're absolutely correct. So today we're talking about our pollinators. And pollination is the act of when that pollen gets spread from one flower to the next, thus turning our flower into our fruit. But I wanted to highlight our four main pollinators. So clearly we have our bee. We've spent lots of time talking about our bee already and we're only at the beginning of our lesson. But we also have hummingbirds and butterflies. Now these three have something in common, which is basically what they're getting from the plant. So the bee, the hummingbird, and the butterfly are all getting nectar from the plant. We'll talk about more what nectar is, but basically that's the food source that comes from the flower that brings these pollinators to it. These pollinators are attracted to flowers because their bright colors are signaling, hey, I've got nectar for you to eat. However, we also have a mammal, the bat. And if you've ever eaten a tropical fruit before, it's likely that you can also thank a bat for being a pollinator, right? Bats are really attracted to tropical fruits. So then when they, when they fly in to eat that tropical fruit, they're actually getting pollen stuck to their bodies and then pollinating from basically eating a fruit, flying to a next plant, eating that fruit, flying to a next plant, and eating that fruit. So a little bit different than our bee, our hummingbird, and our butterfly. But once again, our bat is an amazing tropical fruit pollinator. So you might have wanted some more information about pollination, so I'm going to kind of dig into it today. But pollination is a really in-depth thing to kind of study, so if you're interested in learning more about this, please feel free to look at the Department of Natural Resources, which has tons of information about your local pollinators, about wild bees, and maybe even how to start a pollinator garden. Now, looking at our example on the right, we have a diagram of a flower. Now, here we have the anther, which is the part of the plant that kind of looks like a bean, and that's what mostly is going to hold our pollen. And then we have the stigma, which is the very top of that kind of drumstick looking part of the plant. Now, basically, in pollination, what needs to happen is the pollen from the anther needs to get to the stigma of the flower, right? Then the part at the very bottom that kind of looks like a pit, it's that brown color, the ovule, will turn into our fruit. So what we need is a pollinator to visit the flower, collect the nectar from the inside, right? And the nectar is located kind of around where the style is. So just by flying up to the plant and trying to drink the nectar from it, you basically have pollination. So the pollinator goes from flower to flower, drinking the nectar, which is basically like a sugar water, and collecting pollen, which has amazing, awesome proteins for different insects and animals, and then, go, in some cases, goes back home, goes back to a hive, um, and makes maybe honey, or they're content with their day, they've collected all of their nectar, and they can basically continue on with their life. 
And we do want to talk a little bit about the difference between a wild bee and a honeybee. So the honeybee gets lots and lots and lots of attention, right? We know that honeybees are important for making our honey. We know the honeycomb structure, which is pictured below, is the hexagon. Um, and one thing that we often don't know is that the honeybee is actually more of a farm animal. So honeybees live in hives. Um, they make our honey, and that's the farm thing that is produced from farming bees. So kind of like you keep chickens to get an egg, you keep honeybees to get the honey. Um, they're not necessarily bred for the purpose of pollinating. They're bred for the purpose of harvesting honey for other people. And actually North America didn't have any honeybees before it was colonized. That's something, that's a farm animal that our, the colonizers brought over when they were coming to colonize North America. And because of that, honeybees actually don't know how to pollinate certain plants, right? Which, how do those plants get pollinated? Thus, the wild bee. So wild bees are bees that are indigenous, are native to this area. Um, they have been here for thousands and thousands of years, and they have grown and evolved with specific plants that grow right in your area. So most of these bees aren't really making honey in the same way that a honeybee would, um, but they are our number one pollinator. Um... An example that I always give is pumpkins. Honeybees aren't really great at pollinating pumpkins, but wild bees, there are specific types that are amazing at pollinating pumpkins. Um, another thing to keep in mind is there are over 4,000 native species of wild bees right here in Wisconsin alone. And that'd be like walking down the street and seeing about 4,000 different types of dogs, right? Um, they come in all different shapes, all different colors, all different sizes um, that you can kind of see throughout our next slide, right? We're gonna go over some of the types of bees that are native to this area, starting with our mason bee, which is this bee right here. So this bee is kind of unique because it finds holes in wood to live in, so not a hive structure. We know that most of our wild bees are actually solitary or living in ground nests, so they're not really in a hive or a colony like our honeybees. But this bee finds holes in wood, in wood to live in and kind of makes a nest in that area. And then we have our carpenter bees, which are located right here on our slide. And they create holes in soft wood in order to burrow. So unlike the mason bee that finds holes, these bees are actually carpenters, exactly true to their name, and are actually making those holes for themselves. So kind of like building their own homes. Then we have our leaf cutter bee. The leaf cutter bee, as you can probably guess, is this one right here, which actually creates really amazing, almost perfect circles into leaves, and then use, uses those pieces of leaves in order to insulate their homes. And this is very interesting because we can kind of see the craftsmanship of leaf cutter bees making their homes through this picture that is shown, because you can kind of see how the bee is going in and almost making a perfect arc. We also have our bumblebee, right? This is our bumblebee right here, a fluffy, cute little friend. Um, bumblebees are gonna be our closest to a honeybee. So they're living in a, a colony or a hive. They also have a queen. It's very similar to the structure of a how a honeybee lives. And then we also have our ground nester bees, which kind of look like here, right here. Often these are confused with wasps or hornets. Um, and that's mostly just due to the fact that they do look very similar. Their striped markings are very similar. Sometimes they're bigger in nature, which makes them people think that they're they are wasp when in fact they're not. Um, and these bees, true to their name, exactly nest underground. So um, it's always best practice to when you're gardening, maybe make sure that there's no signs of ground nesting bees. Look for them in your area before you start digging if you're in a school garden just to make sure that you're not disrupting ground nesting bees habitats because they are so important for our environment. And I wanted to share some native bee facts, right? Um, we know that a lot of times students will ask me, well, what's, what, what is a wasp? What is a hornet? What is a bee? Um, what's the difference between these? And actually, this distinction happened about 125 million years ago. So as flowers kind of started develop, to develop on our world, we saw a split between the wasps and bees. So wasps are actually carnivores. They hunt prey, um, whether that be small animals or parasite or um, small bugs, right? They're hunting animals, um, hunting insects. So 
the difference here is that bees have kind of switched more to a vegetarian diet and they've decided that they want to grow and evolve with the flowers in order to harvest nectar from them. So the main difference between a wasp and a bee is that a wasp is an herbivore or a vegetarian and I'm sorry, a bee is a herbivore or a vegetarian and a wasp is more carnivorous and hunts its prey. Um, like I said earlier, pollen is super rich in proteins. And the cool thing about eating local honey um, is that if that local honey does have a little bit of local pollen in it and you have an allergy to pollen that's seasonal, um, it can actually help inoculate you against that pollen allergy. So kind of like if you were to get a flu shot to prevent the flu, if you eat a little bit of honey that is um, locally grown, and locally created, it's probably going to have some things that'll help you fight off that pollen allergy. Another thing is only female bees have stingers. We know that sweepingly across all native bees and honeybees, the female bees are the workers, right? So they're going to be the ones that are mostly out and about. Um, that's basically why they have stingers. And we'll talk about stings in a little bit. Um, another cool thing that I wanted to share is that bees are actually separated into categories based on tongue length, which absolutely makes sense when we take into account the anatomy of a flower, right? So if you're, you have a very, very long style, you're going to need a bee that has a very, very long tongue in order to pollinate it. And if you have a very short style here, you're going to need a bee that has a shorter tongue in order to drink from it, right? So that's kind of how the bees are separated um, based on their tongue length, right? Another really neat thing is that bees actually make pollen loaves out of their own saliva for their babies. How cute is that, right? And lots of people think, ew, gross, bee saliva. But actually, something really neat is that saliva from bees has antibacterial and antifungal agents. And lots of times people might ask me, oh, well, like, how does honey get made? And that's, you might think, why am I making the bridge saliva to honey? Well, basically what happens is a honeybee flies to the flower, drinks the nectar, and then flies back to the hive which we've talked about looks kind of like this honeycomb. And then they might communicate with their other beehive friends using their waggle dance, which I will talk about in a minute. And then if they decide that they do have nectar that they're going to make into honey, which is mostly what happens, bees will, honeybees will put it into their honey stomach because bees have two stomachs and then actually vomit that nectar up into another bee's mouth. That bee will chew on it and then vomit it into another bee's mouth, and then that bee will chew on it. And then once that nectar that's basically like sugar water has kind of turned into a little bit of a more sticky, stretchy substance that we know as honey, they will put it into their honeycombs, which we've talked about here, and seal it up with beeswax, dry it with their wings, and then that can save all throughout the winter. And that's also what we eat. So we actually are directly benefited from that saliva that comes from bees because it's antibacterial and antifungal. So there's not a ton of cleaning that goes into our honey once it's in the bottle, right? So did you know that when you eat honey, you're basically eating bee spit and nectar from a flower. How cool is that? You can't get more organic than that. But really quickly to talk about the waggle dance, um, bees are extremely, extremely smart at communicating and actually have their own language that's basically through dance and body movements. Um, in particular, this video, which you can find in our lesson slides that are attached to our teleschool kit. Um, you, I would definitely encourage you to view. It's an amazing video from the Smithsonian that goes over actually all of the math that goes into bees calculating how to fly to certain flowers that are the most nectar producing based on a bee's dance that is given via instructions to the rest of the hive. So you can kind of see the bee here is calculating the distance from and the angle from the sun to the flower, and then it dances in a figure eight kind of across the board like this. And then once it's done kind of communicating that angle, it actually waggles its body. And however long it waggles for is the distance that the bee has to fly from the hive to get to the flower. Um, of course, we don't know what bee units of distance are, 
but sometimes they can fly miles and miles to get to these flowers. So it's very, very neat way of communicating. I also wanted to talk about bee stings. I feel like every single time I teach this lesson, so many students want to share their bee sting stories and have an immediate fear reaction to bees. And I want to tell you all, bees do not want to sting you. If they are landing on you, it's probably because they're attracted to maybe a bright color on your shirt, a floral pattern, or maybe if you spilled like a popsicle or something and it has a sweet scent, really, they just think you're a flower. So once they land on you, they're pretty smart. They'll figure out pretty quickly that you don't have any nectar to offer them and they'll fly away because they need to collect that nectar to get food for the winter. It's a very important job. So keep this in mind um, as you're thinking about bees landing on you and maybe a fear response would be to run away or to try to swat it, but bees don't want to sting you. Some bees actually die when they sting you. And we know that bees are super important for growing our food, right? If we have no bees, we don't really have any food. Um, so keep that in mind next time a bee lands on you. Best practice is to just stay completely still because like I said, bees are smart. They will figure out that you are not a flower, I promise. And I just wanted to kind of cap this lesson off by giving you a short list of plants that need bee pollination. So we kind of know that bees are important for growing food. And for me, the magnitude of this wasn't really brought home until I saw the massive list of plants that are mainly pollinated by bees, right? So if you look on this list, I know I've been able to find my meal that I had for breakfast multiple times. If I had an orange and grapefruit salad with coffee, that's all on this list. Or if you're really enjoying potatoes, that's on this list too. It's the first thing we listed, right? So um, lots of our fruits, lots of our nuts, right? All of these things that are kind of important to everyday life would basically be gone. So keep this in mind as we're talking about our pollinators and how important they are. Um, we really need to put our best foot, foot forward into protecting our bee species. So thank you so much for listening to our lesson. Um, please come back next time. Uh, we're, our next lesson is about composting and the nutrient cycle. Thank you.